want to say welcome to everyone. It's good to be back in the pulpit here at New City Home Church. Love y'all. Love our church. Thankful for what God is doing amongst us, uh, especially this year. Really, it's been encouraging to see the spirit working in our midst and uh, what God does when his people depend on him and depend on him in prayer and in faith. You see God honor that faith. I want to say welcome to me and Jenna's good friend Esther visiting us and then my my fellow blurred black nerd Michael here. So it's good to see y'all. Encouraging to look out and see y'all's faces. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. Father God, would you be glorified today? Would your son be exalted? Holy Spirit, would you do the work that only you can do? Lord, whatever is on our hearts, our minds, Lord God, would we put that aside to receive from you the word that you have for us from your word? Forgive us, O oh Lord, for our sins as we forgive those who have done us wrong. Holy Spirit, may the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, my God. Cleanse me, cleanse all of us in the blood of your son, Jesus. And Father, we pray all this in the name of your dear son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who are you? What is your name? Throughout world history, a name is not just a name. A name is, throughout world history, even in today's times, in certain parts of the world, a name is synonymous with who you are as a person. And some of this is seen in one of my favorite movies of all time, 2018's Black Panther. And if you've seen that movie, you'll know the scene when Killmonger, Eric Stevens, and uh, T'Challa are find the first meeting. They're talking in person. And in that scene, Killmonger says, I want the throne. And all the elders of Wakanda kind of laugh at him. It's like, who are you? And he goes, ask me who I am. And T'Challa knows who he is. T'Challa knows. That's why he says, the only reason why I don't kill you where you stand is because I know who you are. What do you want? He goes, again, I want the throne. And he says, ask me who I am. And Princess Shuri walks up and says, you're Eric Stevens, a Black American operative and a mercenary nicknamed Killmonger. That's who you are. And Killmonger says something, which I love. He goes, that's not my name, princess. Ask me, King. Ask me. And T'Challa says, take him away. No, I'm not going to ask you. And finally, one of the Wakandan elders shouts out in Wakandan, who are you? And all of a sudden, you see Killmonger's facade drop and you see this the years the decades of pain and trauma and hatred and he shouts out I am in Jadaka son of Prince Unjobu and at that everyone stops and says what this is the descendant of Prince Unjobu and basically what they're realizing is when he says who he is his name it alerts them that it's not just the name but it shows them who he truly is is and that revelation changes the rest of the movie it drives the plot for it is important he had been waiting decades for someone to ask him who his name is but more importantly not just who his name is but who he truly was our passage genesis 32 22 to 32 is dealing with this theme, this theme of names and of identities. And in our passage, we see Jacob, one of the Hebrew patriarchs, right? He's a hero of the faith. We think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as these heroes of the faith, and they are. But if you read Genesis and you read the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you realize that they don't always act like heroes of the faith. They do some real shady stuff. And yet, they're called heroes of the faith. They're held up as examples of faithfulness, right? But in our passage, we see Jacob. Genesis 32, 22, we find Jacob held captive by fear of his older brother Esau. 
Why? Because if you remember back in Genesis 27, Jacob, whose name is kind of synonymous with deceit, trickery. Jacob tricks, along with his mother, Rebecca, tricks Isaac, his father. And he receives Esau's birthright and blessing. Now, in ancient Hebrew culture, this is important. The, 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 the blessing, the inheritance the firstborn son would receive from the father was of extreme importance. It was a great honor to receive your father's uh, uh, estate, his legacy as the firstborn son. And Jacob has stolen that from Esau. And so what does Jacob do? Rebecca says, hey, you need to get out of, you need to leave now, because when Esau catches up with you, it ain't gonna be good, run. So Jacob flees, and for 20 years, him and Esau don't see each other. He flees from the wrath of Esau. And now in Genesis 32, Jacob is ready to go back into the promised land. Because God told him, I want you to go back. But he knows who's there waiting for him. His older brother Esau, whom he betrayed. So what does he do? He hears from his messengers, hey, I know you wanted us to go to Esau and tell him that you're coming. But you need to know that Esau is actually coming out to meet you and he's not alone. He has 400 of his men coming with him. And don't forget what God, what Isaac his father prophesied and blessed him with uh, earlier in Genesis. He says, listen, I can't give you the birthright anymore, the blessing, because I already gave it to Jacob. But let me tell you a little bit about who you will be, Esau. You're going to be a man who lives by the sword. In other words, you're going to be a warrior. So when Jacob hears my brother's coming to meet me with 400 of his men, what he see, what he thinks about is Esau is coming to kill me. Finally. My past is caught up. Esau is coming to kill me, my wives, my children, my servants, and my livestock. And so Jacob is utterly terrified. So he sends gifts to his brother. He sends gifts, hoping that Esau would not exact revenge. So at this point, Jacob has no idea what's about to go down. He prays to God in Genesis 32. God, you told me to go back. You promised that through me, the promise you gave to my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac would come through me. You promised, you told me to go back, but Esau is coming to meet me. 400 of his men, God, what are you doing? Help me, God. He literally says in Genesis 32, he says, God, save me. Save me from the wrath of my brother. And it's here in this terrified condition that we wait with Jacob alone at night as he prepares for this dreaded brotherly reunion. So there's only two points this morning we're going to talk about. Point number one, a new name. And point number two, a new walk. Our first point, a new name. If you have your Bible, turn with me, Genesis 32, and read with me verses 22 through 30. It says, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jebek. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, it is because I saw God face to face 
and yet my life was spared. Again, a lot about names and identities, even down to the location of where this wrestling match takes place. And I want you to notice that verse 24, it says that Jacob was left alone at night until a man suddenly comes on the scene. And this man initiates not a conversation, but a wrestling match with Jacob. Listen, Jacob is already terrified of, of Esau. And all of a sudden, imagine, imagine you're going through something heavy on your soul. You want some time alone. So you go wait. You're in the dark. You're crying out to God. And all of a sudden you turn around and there's this man who was not there a minute ago standing right there. And the man doesn't say, hey, don't be afraid like angels would do. He doesn't say, hey, I'm here to bless you. No, he grabs you, starts wrestling with you. So not only are you terrified, but now you're like, who is this dude wrestling with me, right? And Jacob is like, hey, man, what's up? Who are you? He doesn't know this man. This man wasn't there. But he's praying, looks around, and there's this man, and the man just starts to wrestle with him. But see, Jacob's been wrestling all of his life. Jacob wrestled with Esau. It said the prophecy that the Lord gave to Rebekah said, your two sons are two nations. And unlike the ancient world, not, it's not that the younger will serve the older. The older will serve the younger. That's abnormal. And that when Esau came out the womb, it says that Jacob was holding on to his heel. Do you guys remember what God promises Adam and Eve in the garden? What he tells Satan, he goes, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. When Jacob is holding the heel, that's pointing to hostility between the brothers and the peoples. God is already prophesying there will be hostility between Esau and Jacob, and there will be uh, hostility between the two peoples that they represent. In other words, there will be animosity too between the seed of the woman, the people of God, and the seed of the serpent, those who follow him, those who reject Christ. Right? There's so much going on in this passage. And then Jacob has been wrestling also with Laban, his father-in-law, do you remember? He says, hey, I want to marry your daughter. And Laban says, okay, work for me for seven years. He does. And then Laban tricks him, gives him Leah. And he says, I'll give you the, my, my, hey, look at, look at, look at, hey, look at Will. <laughs> I'm looking at Will. We're like, yeah, we've been throwing hands at that point. But that's not what Jacob does. Jacob says, fine, I'll serve you another seven years. So Jacob receives a taste of his own medicine. He reaps what he has sown to an extent. And now Jacob is wrestling with this random man that has appeared out of nowhere. And verse 25 tells us that this man could not beat Jacob in the rest of the match. So what does he do? He, 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 he's wrestling. Come on, Gary, you know what to do. Let's go. And all of a sudden, oh, shoot. Jacob's still holding on to him, but hey, bro, he now kind of shaking, looking like a deer in a bounce house. And he's, he, he's like, hey, hey, he touched me. And all of a sudden now I got this, I got this issue, right? And then the mysterious man tells Jacob, let me go. For basically it's morning. Let me go. And what does Jacob do though? He doesn't listen to the man. He says something that's abnormal. He says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm willing to bet if you're wrestling with some random stranger at night that you don't know, you're not going to ask him to bless you. So why does Jacob say, I won't let you go until you bless me? It's because Jacob is starting to pick up clues as to who this man truly is. It's starting to click in Jacob's mind. This ain't no ordinary man that I'm wrestling with. He's starting to realize, I think I know who this man truly is. And he's starting to realize something too. The one who deceived and betrayed in order to get his father's blessing is the same Jacob who is now realizing that in order to get and receive the blessing that he's been asking God for now, 
he's realizing he has to do it the right way. No more trickery, no more deceit, no more lies. He realizes I finally need to go to the one I should have gone to from the very beginning. I need to go to God himself. How often we try to receive God's blessings in our lives through unholy means. We try to grasp God's blessings in sinful ways. Jacob knows that he's one of the promised seed. He knows that God has placed a call and, and promise on his life. But instead of trusting God to give him what he has promised him, he seeks to grasp it himself. The same way Abraham and Sarah did. Abraham, I know how old you are, but I promise you, you will have children, as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. But Abraham and Sarah, like us, because let's not look at the characters in the Bible, real people, and turn our noses down on them like we would do any better. Y'all, we do the same things they do. Instead of trusting God, Sarah says, go sleep with my maiden. Go do it. Trying to grab a hold of God's promises in their flesh by their own power. We do the same thing, so. Brother, that's that right there. Our brother James said, have mercy, Lord. Thank God we do have a God who has mercy on us. That's what this story shows us. Amen. He preached in the sermon too. Thank God we have a God who does show mercy when we falter in our faith. When we don't trust him, we say, God, I know what you said, but I don't trust you're going to give it to me in your timing and in your way. So I will do it. I'll help you out, God. And yet, instead of God casting this away, God has mercy on us. Thank God we have a God who shows and delivers mercy. And what Jacob doesn't realize, y'all, is that this is mercy. The wrestling match is the mercy of God on him, the answer to his prayers. And in verse 27, we're confronted with the same question I asked you earlier. Who are you? The man asked Jacob in verse 27, what is your name? And remember, he's not really, he's not just asking the name. He's asking, who are you really, Jacob? And Jacob only says, Jacob, why? Because again, he's starting to figure out who this man truly is. So when he says, I'm Jacob, he's confessing his nature. He's saying, I'm Jacob. I'm the one who holds on to hills and supplants and deceives and betrays and doesn't trust. And only when Jacob finally confesses and realizes who he is before God, when he humbles himself, then does he receive the promise, the blessing. And this man, though, he says in verse 28, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. And, and, and after that, Jacob asked this man, what is your name? In verse 29, and the man says, basically, what is it to you? One thing about this is that God determines who he reveals himself to and how he reveals himself. We have no claim on God. God doesn't do our will. We do his will. God basically tells Jacob, don't worry. Number one, you know who I am. Basically, God is telling Jacob, you know who I am. But he says, that's all you're going to get. In other words, I'm in control of this encounter. This is happening because of my sovereign will. That's why Jesus, when he's in Matthew 11, he goes, uh, uh, the father reveals the son and the son reveals the father to him, whoever he wills. It's all up to God's sovereign will who he reveals himself to, and how he reveals himself. And we are to receive who God is based on the word, not what we want God to be. There are difficult doctrines and things in the Bible, but we don't get to pick and choose. This is not a buffet. We receive the entire testimony of the word of God. 
because that's God's revelation to us and how we, we cannot be those who say, well, God, I don't like this part of your Bible, so I don't accept it. No, we don't have that right. So God is saying, basically, Jacob, you are basically, you know who I am. And that's all you're going to get. Jacob realizes that he had been wrestling all night with God himself. He realized that this man he won against allowed him to win. Listen, this man could have easily killed Jacob. First touch, he could have easily killed him like that. But he, this man came to him, God came to him because he wanted to bless Jacob. When God comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ, he comes to us not to condemn, not to judge, but to save. He says, the son did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. This is why Jacob says, I've seen God face to face and my life has been spared. Listen, this right here is called a Christophany. A Christophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So when you see, for instance, the angel of the Lord, for instance, in Exodus 3, when Moses looks at the burning bush, it says that the angel of the Lord was in that burning bush. But what does Moses call the angel of the Lord a few verses later? He goes, God. The pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus is all in the Bible, not just in the new. He's in the Old Testament, too. The angel of the Lord. This man that he's wrestling with is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. God will protect Jacob. He gives Jacob the blessing. And he changes his name and his identity. So I want to ask you, what is your name and who are you? As Christians like Jacob, we recognize our sinfulness before God. The issue, though, is that many in the church describe themselves by their sinfulness. I'm a wretch. I'm just a worm. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. As if that's all you are in the eyes of God. When they think of who they are, they think of themselves in terms of their past mistakes, their sin. And they're just their old, their past. That's in their mind. That's their primary identity to God is I'm just a sinner. I'm a wretch. Something Pastor Lance says, he said to me back uh, last year, it sticks with me. He goes, we have been conditioned to relate to God out of our abundant sin instead of the abundant life God has given to us. Perhaps that's you this morning. I know that's too often that's me. Coming to God, relating to him as if I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Your sins, your past, the stuff that you can't forget, your regrets, your shame, that no longer defines who you are. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's who you are. You are a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you? What is your name? Ephesians 1.4 says, for God chose us in Christ Jesus before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Who are you? You are a Christian. You are in Christ. You want to know who you are? The one who just looked at stuff they shouldn't have looked at the night before. The one who struggles with sin. The one who yells and gets angry, cusses people out. The one who struggles with sin. You want to know who you are this morning? You're holy and blameless in his sight. Because you are in his son. Your sins do not define who you are in God's sight any longer. Jesus defines who you are. We relate to him based upon the work and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's the good news of the gospel. And this frees us from trying to create our own identity. We live in a society that is so obsessed with creating oneself, redefining oneself. Y'all, the identity that we have is not something that comes from within us or from, uh, or from us. The identity that you have, I have, comes from outside of us. God gives you your identity. He says, this is who you are. Your identity is all about the triune God. It's all about what Jesus has done for us, done for you in his life, death, burial, and resurrection, and his ascension in heaven, and his intercession. Jesus right now sits at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us, pours out his spirit upon us, Lavishes us with goodness. Even when we sin, even when we falter, even when we don't listen, still my dearly beloved children. That is the good news of Jesus. God says, You no longer are identified by your sin. When I see you, 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 you. That is the good news of the gospel. That's what I need when I struggle with my sin. When I yell at my kids and when I struggle with what I think and what I feel, I need a word from God that says, beloved, holy, blameless, beautiful. Mom, you belong to me. And this leads us to our second point, a new walk. Read with me verses 31 and 32, and we'll close out. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Jacob's encounter with God did not leave him unchanged. His encounter with God utterly transformed him. And Jacob, now known as Israel, he walked differently. He limped. And it wasn't just apparent to him. Everyone saw Jacob wasn't limping before last night, but now he's limping. They saw this change in Jacob because of his encounter with the living God. In a similar way, our encounter with God does not leave us unchanged. When we recognize our sinfulness before God and see Jesus face to face in the gospel, the Holy Spirit transforms us. He transforms you. We began to walk different. And when the scriptures speak of walking, it's speaking of how we live our lives, the direction that we're going in. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead, spiritually dead in your trespasses and sin in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world. You lived according to this world and its standard, its values. And yet Paul says in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. And because we've been saved by God's amazing grace, abundant grace, Paul says in Ephesians 4.1 that we are to walk worthy of the calling we have received, the calling to be the children of God. Instead of living for ourselves and according to the ways of this world, we now live to please God and to serve others. Our walk 
is guided by the two great commandments, which are to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus says, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And we must never forget that our walk, our new direction of life is rooted, grounded in who we are in Christ Jesus. And as we, like Jacob, as we live out our new direction of life, as we follow not the ways of this world, but the ways of the kingdom of God, the ways of the king of the kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our prayer is that those in our lives would see the change that Christ has made in our lives and continues to make in our life. And that they will be curious and ask us about it so that we can lovingly yet passionately share the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ with them so that they too can have that salvific encounter with God. As we call in this life, in this life, even as Christians, we know this truth that we, yes, we are saved and are being changed, but we also know that we still struggle with sin. We still struggle with the indwelling sin. And in our lives, we will win some battles against sin and in other battles we will lose. Yes, we have a new direction, a new walk because God has saved us, amen? But that doesn't mean that we are going to perfectly obey God in this life. There's a part of us that who we truly are in our, our inner man, our new man, we, we want to, but we know Romans seven, the good things that we want to do, at times we don't find ourselves doing those things and the evil things that we don't wanna do, at times we find ourselves doing those things. And what does Paul say? Who, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ who has delivered us. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Point blank in the story. Receive that people of God. I know you hear me speaking to you, but during the preaching moment, it's not me, it's the Lord Jesus Christ as his word is being faithfully proclaimed. What you're hearing is Jesus saying to you, this is the truth about you. There is now no condemnation for you because you are in me. Receive that by faith. That is God's word over you today and every day. On your best days, and on your worst days, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for you. For you are in Christ Jesus. As a theologian, Chad Bird says, we all limp with God. Our walk with God is full of limping because of our sin and weakness. And yet there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Our new name as Christian, our new identity, who we are is not tied to our imperfect performance and walk with God. It's based and it's tied to the performance and perfect walking of Jesus Christ on your behalf. God does not tie who you are to you and what you do. He ties to who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So rejoice in this news. Re rest in this news. Worship from this news. Walk out and obey God rooted in this good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you? And what is your name? 1 John 3, 1 proclaims and says to us perfectly. How great is the love of the Father. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called, say it again, the children of God. What the angels, I like to, I like to think the angels are up there and they're the ones saying this too. How great is the love 
that God has given to them. His image bears that they who believe in Christ should be called the children of God. And I love how 1 John 3, 1 ends. And that is what we are. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for a new identity, a new name, and we have a new walk. Lord, we need to hear, though, more than anything else, who we are in you, Jesus. Help us to be rooted in your gospel. Help us to do our daily lives, to walk, to obey you, rooted firm in the gospel. On our good days, our best days, we're in need of your grace in Christ. And on our worst days, we're never outside or far from your grace. We have it in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the amazing love that you've lavished upon us, that we are called your children, for that is what we are. In Jesus' name, amen.